Ah, geek out. What two episodes in a single week? That's right. You know, whenever we have uh, somebody on the show, the understanding, at least on my end, is that we try to get the stuff out before or on the release date of what they're promoting. That's just professional courtesy. Um, so yeah, sometimes you're going to see two book reviews in a single week. Sometimes you're going to see two interviews in a single week. The only other time it happened, now that I'm thinking about it, is when we had a, a double whammy with Zach Kaplan and China Clugston Flores. And uh, this week is another one of those weeks. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. And honestly, it's a fantastic interview. It's Anthony Johnston. He's here to talk about his book, Ghost Station Zero, uh, out in comic book stores uh, today. So And Comixology, if you you know you want to just get it on your iPad or whatever, your Kindle. Um, so yeah, let's let him talk about it. And joining us for a third time, he pulls the hat trick. Mm-hmm. Anthony Johnston's back on the show, this time talking the uh, newest adventure of Codename Babushka, Ghost Station Zero. The first issue comes out in comic book stores everywhere and on Comixology on Wednesday, August 2nd. Uh, also, something that you should probably check out, The Coldest City and The Coldest Winter are available on Comixology through Oni Press uh, if you're looking to see the basis. And, you know, while you're at it, go out and see uh, Atomic Blonde out in theaters everywhere starting, uh, well, by the time this thing comes out, it'll, I mean, shoot, when we're recording the things. Yeah, uh, (laughs) because I I actually happened to check it out last night Uh, and uh, and, uh, going into it knew that we were interviewing uh, Mr. Mr. Anthony Johnston today, uh, and like when his name popped up in the credits, not just for like story by credit, but also producer credit. I was like, hey, hey, good for him! <laughs> <laughs> and sp- <laughs> w- without much further ado, here he is, Anthony. Thanks for coming back on. Uh, hello, it's good to be here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I think the one of the big questions is obviously, you know, writing Lorraine in the coldest city, writing uh, Babushka in. Both uh, the Conclave of Death and here in Ghost Station Zero. What is it that really draws you to the kind of like almost modesty blaze esque like espionage fiction? I'm really glad that you mentioned modesty blaze because that's a large part of it. I'm a big modesty blaze fan. I have been for a long time. Uh, they're not that well known outside of the UK, but in you know within the UK and certainly to a certain generation of comics readers, modesty blaze is you know a classic. Um, And yeah, Codename Babushka specifically was very much, you know, I knew I wanted to do something along the lines of Modesty Blaze, uh, my kind of homage, tribute to Modesty, if you like. Uh, And so that was that was one of the the basic factors uh, in my decision to create Codename Babushka. Uh, And then with Lorraine, uh, I mean, I think they're quite different characters. The only real similarity they have i mean they're both kick-ass women but apart from that the only real similarity they have is that they're both kind of ice cool uh you know neither of them loses their cool or their composure um lorraine is much more in the book anyway is much more a sort of uh calculating intellectual customer than babushka in her stories um but they are both strong independent-minded and very focused women yeah who don't kind of lose their cool and composure and maybe that's what attracts me to it because again modesty blaze is very much like that um and a lot of my favorite female heroes on screen you know people like ripley in aliens or sarah connor in terminator 2 uh well or or in terminator 1 you know they're like that as well they're very strong-minded women who don't fall apart when things start to go wrong and i find that very appealing well, I mean, speaking of things, uh, espionage things that were big in in the UK or bigger bigger in the UK than than say here, would the you know either Diana Rigg or um, Honor Blackman's Avengers kind of fit into that inspiration as well? Absolutely, yeah. I watched the uh, the UK Avengers series, uh, the Diana Rigg series specifically, um, when I was a child. A lot of the '60s stuff was being repeated on. British TV when I was a child. So things like the the original Avengers, but also shows like Man From U.N.C.L.E. and The Champions and um, I'm I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, um, what was the one that uh, Edward Woodward did before The Equalizer? Um, Callan, even stuff like Man in a Suitcase. All of these shows, and not all of them are spy shows, of course, but, you know, all of these shows from the 60s were being repeated on British TV when I was a child. And I think they had, my mom was a big, fan of them and so i watched them as well and i think they had quite an influence on me because that sort of i don't know that kind of euro spy genre with that veneer of 60s call has always really appealed to me and of course they're all based in a world of the cold war um and so you know i think that plus a love of 
things like John le Carre novels is what draws me to the Cold War specifically for the coldest books. And then Codename Babushka is modern day, so it's not Cold War, but there's still that Russia-America rivalry kind of feeling that runs through the book. <laughs> not just the book these days. Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> not to get too political, of course. Um, yeah, let's not let's not steer into that. <laughs> of course, of course not. Uh, but you know, you do mention um, obviously the ghost stations in Ghost Station Zero. Um, I feel like I mean that's a term that originated in in Berlin during the Cold War with the the subway stations, metro stations that were shut down because of the division, right? That's correct. Yeah, I mean here that's not what it's being used for here. Uh, but I, I thought it was just such a cool term <laughs> that I, I wanted to use it somewhere. Uh, the ghost stations in Ghost Station Zero are ex so the Soviet ex Cold War listening bases and monitoring stations, um, which are fictionalized. Uh, you know, to the best of my knowledge, they didn't. They don't actually exist. But what did e absolutely exist were genuine like small uh, scale listening stations uh, around the world where soviet technicians and signalers and soldiers would listen to radio airwave signals and monitor what was going on in the world around them incognito you know they would be undercover and in disguise um from these uh small hidden bases dotted all over the globe so i've just kind of taken that concept and expanded on it really uh, and then yes i used the the ghost station name just because i think it's such a cool name <laughs> Agreed. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> there is a, uh, almost in, in more ways than the Conclave of Death, the previous arc, there is a cinematic sense. Um, you know, the, I, I love the prologue with the shipping containers and everything in this first issue, you know, leading into what I su suppose is the main story for the next four issues. Was How has it been working with Shari, and has there been any change since working on the Conclave of Death when kind of brainstorming these sequences and set pieces? The main change has been that uh, we don't have to introduce the character anymore. Uh, you know, the Conclave of Death, we had to introduce Babushka herself. We had to uh, introduce the setup of her being blackmailed into working for this black ops division of the CIA and with Georgi sitting at home uh, monitoring her from New York. You know, all, the, all these little bits that kind of help it all make sense and set the scenario up. We had to do that at the same time as telling a story, uh, the story itself of the Conclave of Death. So it's more just that with this one, we have a lot more freedom. You know, we know that readers know who Babushka is. They know the setup. Uh, they know the characters. And so we can just get on with doing a story. And also just because of the way this story panned out, you know, we wanted to make it more action uh, filled and have a bit more globe trotting in it and, you know, make it feel more like a sort of modern action spy movie. Um, so, yeah, we just kind of really focused on making it, as you say, a bit more, feel a bit more cinematic and a bit more wide open. Uh, and, you know, things blow up a lot more in this one. <laughs> Which is, ex again, that you guys really do hit the ground running or more accurately on motorcycles with this one. So, right. You know. <laughs> hit the ground revving. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. very good. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um. You know, something we saw over the course of the Conclave of Death, we were really, as you were mentioning, getting to know Babushka, seeing how she was kind of like fitting in, being a kind of a blackmailed agent for, for uh, Eon and everything. What is kind of her personal arc and what are the themes, the deeper themes that you see over the course of, um, over the course of Ghost Station Zero? Ghost Station Zero is mostly about, in terms of Babushka personally, it's mostly about her coming to terms with who she now is, uh, you know, as this blackmailed operative for uh, for Eon. And so it's uh, she's learning that she literally can't trust anyone, including, you know, the people running her um, and maybe getting a sense. Well, I don't want to give too much away, but let's say that she starts to get quite comfortable towards the end of this uh, story. Not literally. She's bruised and battered you know, throughout the whole thing. Sure. Uh, but psychologically, she starts to maybe get a bit comfortable with the idea of what she's doing. Um, and then uh, we're going to throw a spanner in those works. And, you know, you'll see that at the end, but I don't want to give anything away. So it's uh, the idea of Babushka investigating, you know, literal, not literal, maybe there's some literal ghosts, but figurative ghosts of the uh, of the Cold <laughs> War. 
kind of juxtaposes against her own confrontation of the past or of, of her own past? Uh, well, in a sense, yeah. Um, that just that confrontation with her own past is that will be coming up. It doesn't actually take place in this story, but it's definitely you know it's on the cards. Um, but the main emphasis for this uh, for this story arc, you know, and we make we make no apologies for it, is to be a roller coaster action filled ride. There are more fist fights and guns and explosions in this story arc than uh, you know than in two conclaves of death. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is the uh, most of the conclave of death was set on the on the cruise ship? Is most of uh, Ghost Station Zero going to be set in Switzerland? No, no, no. This is a, like I said. This is a proper globe trotting one. Which she starts in China. She goes to Switzerland, then she goes to uh, I think Canada, uh, and then and then I'm not going to tell you where else she goes because that <laughs> would give it away. But <laughs> Ooh, <fair enough. laughs> um. Well, shoot, without, again, okay, we're going to kind of, this is kind of going to be a counterintuitive question then, but what can we expect um, in the, you know, beyond this first issue of Ghost Station Zero? Uh, well, uh, so in the first issue, obviously, she sort of realizes that she is uh, getting warm on the trail, uh, because the the mission, for those who haven't read the sort of synopsis of the previous the mission is that a uh, an ER, an ex- another eon agent has been investigating these ghost stations and he's gone missing in switzerland and that's why babushka is called to switzerland to basically find out find him or if not him find out what he knew and make contact with the source that was giving him the information that he was passing back to her headquarters uh and so that's how she gets to switzerland and then by the end of the first issue she has made contact with that agent um and things are already starting to go wrong. Uh, and then throughout the rest of the issues, she's she's effectively trying to figure out why this villain is trying to find these uh, unearth these ghost stations. Um, you know, to what purpose, and whether or not she should stop them, or whether she even can stop them. Um, again, I don't want to really give too much away because part of the fun of this is that the villain's motives are unclear until maybe about halfway through the story. I totally understand. Totally understand. Um, so, and I, if you know my work, you know that I'm, you know, I do lots and lots of mystery stuff. So that, that aspect of it is important to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, another image comic series you do is, is the fuse with Justin Greenwood, which is all, you know, all mysteries, whether it being, you know, murder. Well, it's always murder mysteries now that I think about it, but they're all. But they're... It's mostly murder mystery. Well, we did a few non murders in uh, the Perihelion story arc, but there were two murder mysteries in that arc as well. Um, but we did do other stuff besides murder mysteries in that one, yeah. And I remember that that was the arc where it was basically like a very hedonistic, like Mardi Gras esque party on the uh, space station, right? That's correct, yeah. Perihelion is the day when the Earth, and therefore, you know, in our story, the fuse, is closest to the sun. Uh, and on the fuse, the whole town basically goes a bit crazy. And so whereas the other story arcs are one murder over the course of several days, uh, Perihelion is one day containing several cases. So it's literally 24 hours in the life of the Midway Police Department. But on that particular day when it's all hands on deck, all leave is cancelled and uh, the whole station just goes a bit wild. It's kind of There was a Judge Dread arc. Uh, I feel like it was like 24 hours in the day of dread, and I, I don't know. The if graveyard was... shift. Yes, was that it? Was that an influence? Yes, absolutely. That was a a 100 percent influence. Well done, sir. You are, <laughs> I think, the first person to actually spot that. Wow. Well, let me <laughs> brush my shoulder off a bit. Um, so the the fourth trade of the fuse had come out back in back in February. Is there going to do you and Justin have any plans for a for a fifth arc? Yes, we do. We have taken a hiatus at the moment uh, because we had a few other things to do. Um, We'd been doing the fuse straight for like three years, uh, you know, which is a long time to do one book. And uh, and we we always knew that we would do those four um, story arcs because we knew that that was how long it would take to resolve Ralph Ralph's story arc, Ralph Dietrich's story arc. you know the overall story arc that he had over those four volumes and reveal his secret and sort of get to the bottom of it so we knew that we would do those four volumes but we always said that after those four volumes we would then reassess 
and figure out, you know, what we wanted to do. Uh, so we got to the end and we, we reassessed and Justin had been offered uh, the gig of doing the Hamilton graphic novel uh, with Penguin Random House that I believe is due to be published very soon or it may even be out. Uh, if not, then it's certainly imminent, you know, very, very soon. And obviously any graphic novel is going to take quite a bit of time. So he wanted to be able to do that. I had a few other things on my mind, such as the upcoming release of Atomic Blonde. And uh, we just sort of, you know, we figured that was a good time to take a break for a while. But we will definitely come back to it because, yes, we already have plans for the fifth story arc. You know, I already have a sort of rough idea of what I want it to be. We've talked about it. Image know that we are going to come back and do it at some point. Uh, it's just a case of getting these other things out of the way so that when we come back, we're fresh again. You know, we've recharged our batteries. It, there was a constant and I, there was a constant theme of uh, escalation in, across those first four arcs. And I'm assuming that's going to as Dietrich and you know, a lot of wheels within wheels in that series. And I assume those are going to start to come to light more moving forward. They will. And also with the fifth story arc, uh, we may finally actually get off the fuse for a short time uh, because something that most people on a, on a quick reading may not realize is that uh, the entire like story, everything we see in all of those four volumes uh, takes place on the fuse. You know, at no point do they go down to Earth. We don't see any scenes of, you know, cops on Earth or anything like that or on the colony on Mars. You know, all these things are talked about. But everything actually takes place on the fuse itself. Um, we were very deliberate about that. But for Volume 5, we that may change. Now, you, you had mentioned uh, Atomic Blonde, again, based off your Oni Press series, um, uh, The Coldest City. I would also be remiss if I didn't ask, what was the experience? Uh, you know, you're credited as a, uh, as a producer on the film. Uh, what what was your experience, you know, with, uh, I remember, I think it was the first time you were on the show, you had just gotten back from Eastern Europe visiting the set. Um, what what was your experience mm -hmm. watching that, watching one of your, one of your books get, get adapted for the big screen? It was, and I'm sure I probably said this uh, in that first interview as well, it was surreal. I mean, the, the main word that I've been saying, using throughout to describe the experience is surreal, uh, because obviously this is not something that happens every day uh at all you know to and sometimes doesn't happen to anyone so uh i've been you know very very lucky uh but the whole thing is yeah just kind of surreal because you are entering a very different world to the world of comic books and graphic novels mm -hmm. um but it's been great it's also been a fantastic experience because uh the producers to their credit they didn't have to uh you know they brought me on board basically and kept me in the loop and sort of made me a part of it uh and i was as involved as i wanted to be um, I partly because, uh, they knew that I was not precious about the material. You know, I've done adaptations myself of, uh, screenplays and books into graphic novels. So I understand how the process works and I understand that you have to make changes that whatever medium you are moving a story to will have its own advantages and disadvantages compared to its source material. Uh, and so you want to take advantage of those. Of course you do. So, yeah, you have to make changes. And I, I understand that. And I don't have a problem with them, therefore, making changes uh, to the movie version of Coldest City. So, yeah, the whole thing has been great. I've given notes throughout. I saw a rough cut uh, earlier this year. No, last year um, when it was being edited and, and uh, you know, gave notes and I gave notes on the screenplays. And, yes, I visited the set. And it's just been the whole thing has been a, a whirlwind. Uh, but also, you know, a really, really good experience. Everybody's been very kind and gracious to me. Um, and now we're all just hoping that it opens well this weekend, you know, fingers crossed. Yeah, I, I think I very briefly passed by and congratulated you at the Hyatt at San Diego last week. I was like, hey. <laughs> well, that that rings a bell, yes. I, ha I, I may have had a few uh, drinks by that point, but... Uh... <laughs> Everybody in the Hyatt, yeah. Everybody in the Hyatt on a Saturday night has a, has a exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking, if we're talking places that feel like Mardi Gras, San Diego, the Gasland right. District. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, to completely, completely change gears for a moment, you've you're in the middle of the third season of Thrash It Out, your own podcast series with uh, Brian Latendry. 
on uh, you know iTunes mm-hmm. and all sorts of things. With this third season, you're really focusing on like the marquee heavy metal albums. Was that a deliberate choice? You know, doing you know obviously like Paranoid or doing Vulgar Display of Power. Um, yeah, you because you had gone a little more obscure earlier. You had done of all the Metallica albums, you had done Saint Anger. <laughs> you know? Which that which, was our first episode. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Which which by the way did get me to appreciate. Saint Anger. Like I went back and wow. re-listened to the album, and I was like, you know what? The drums aren't that yeah. bad. I mean, the snare is still annoying. <laughs> no, the but drums are. Though. Yeah. <laughs> now, now it's like oh, the the drums are the only thing that are really bad. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, oh, well, like I was fantastic. able to appreciate I mean, it as a whole. Aim. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, it was it was a, a deliberate decision on my part. It's only me who is doing the for this volume. I've decided to do the sort of uh, the albums that changed metal uh that was you know a sort of direction that I, I just thought would be interesting to do for a volume because yes as you say i've done up until now a lots of either obscure and or just albums of my own taste that i love but when i was looking through and brian and i both have lists very very long lists of albums <laughs> that we want to cover in the future uh when i was looking through my list in preparation for volume three it occurred to me that what ha- was left Many of the albums that we hadn't talked about, many of the bands that we hadn't yet talked about were bands that literally changed heavy metal as we know it. And so, yeah, I just thought, well, there's a how about let's, you know, for me anyway, I'll focus on those for this volume. And so, yes, Paranoid, Vulgar Display of Power. And I have a few more lined up as well. Um, I'm not going to get to every band and every album that changed metal because metal is an ever evolving genre. It's one of the things I love about it. But I will at least try to cover you know, a fairly good spectrum uh, within my own tastes of albums that uh, that qualify to be called, you know, sort of world-changing. If, if memory serves, you weren't, weren't that keen on well, Maiden or Priest, though I did see Painkiller on the, the, the latest season. Oh, yeah, that was, that was Brian's choice. Uh, <laughs> yes, Brian, Brian loves Judas Priest. Uh, I, I'm in the sort of weird position where, like, Judas Priest are from my hometown. Like, you know, I kind of feel bad about not being a huge fan. Same as Sabbath, and I am a huge Sabbath fan. Judas Priest, uh, I don't, I can listen to them quite happily, but there's something they've never quite, never quite grabbed me in the way that Sabbath did. Um, you know, as I say, it's not in the same, like Iron Maiden's the same. I like Iron Maiden well enough. I will listen to them. I've seen Iron Maiden live, but they don't grab get me they don't quite you know sort of punch me in the gut the same way that bands like sabbath or paradise lost or typo negative do it's going more hardcore i just yeah. picked up a bunch of ice to earth albums myself so i'm i'm, I'm good on oh them. wow yeah <laughs> finally picked up the glorious burden so yeah excellent excellent whereas i'm kind of like in a fozzy kick oddly enough speaking of you know metal Zero. metal music uh chris jericho's Band, of course. <laughs> wow, okay. Going more, but uh, but hey, you know what? The, the 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 new single Judas is probably one of the 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 most rocking songs that they've put out. Okay, uh, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. It's, it, I mean, for the most for the most part, they are a pretty like it's like a silly band almost. Like I don't think it's like intentionally like a comedy act, mm. but like I think Jer- uh, Chris Jericho just kind of like sees the hilarity that happens you know un- unintentionally from a lot of these like 80s bands especially when you're looking back at them from you know like today's sure, perspective yeah. and he just kind of like over exaggerates all of that like you know oh, like hair metal glam metal type attitudes while he's doing this he covers uh uh speaking of iron maiden he covers iron maiden's the prisoner oh, and nice. He he does the intro that ha- that in Iron Maiden's version has you know ex- actual lines from the show The Prisoner, but he does it, I think, by himself. So he's doing like uh, you oh, know a back voices? and forth, yeah, <laughs> and he just <laughs> it's it's uh, it's beautiful and ridiculous if you listen to it. <laughs> so I, I guess give that the gander. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Anthony, to kind of to kind of close us out, as as always. What are you currently geeking out over? Uh, what am I geeking out over? Okay, well, let's start with the heavy metal. So I, uh, for the last few years now, actually, I mean, I've always liked uh, sort of post-metal and neurosis of, you know, one of my favorite bands. I've always liked that sort of stuff. But for the last couple of years, I've been really getting into lots of real sort of like drone and ambient post-metal stuff. Uh, and there is, I'm going to suggest two bands who are both 
obscure underground UK bands, but you can get their stuff on like Bandcamp and places mm-hmm. like that. Uh, and that is about one band called Casual Nun. Uh, no, you didn't mishear that. I said Casual Nun. Uh, <laughs> and another band called Mammoth Weed Wizard Bastard. Which is just one of the best band names in yeah. history. And they both make these amazing, long, dirgy, post-metal, drone metal uh, tracks that are just amazing. I love them. Um, they're actually great writing music for me. There's something about – that's one of the reasons I've started listening to a lot of this stuff so much recently is I find it really good writing music. It sort of – it puts me in a zone somehow but doesn't distract me. Uh, so yeah, it's actually I find it really good for that. Is that what um, you were listening t- to when you were writing Shadow of Mordor? <laughs> <laughs> no, funnily enough, actually, when I was uh, working on Shadow of Mordor, I was mostly because I, what I was doing was all the orcish insults in that game. Uh, so mean, whenever you face thing, off yeah. against an orc and they insult you, that's that's a line I wrote. Um, <laughs> or if they kill you and then they insult your corpse, I wrote those as well. Uh, <laughs> So actually, when I was writing those, I was listening to um, loads of like sort of speed metal and thrash, oh, nice. uh, you know, really like Slayer and early Metallica and uh, Anthrax and stuff like that, uh, because I don't know, it just kind of felt right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it worked out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, in terms of other stuff that I'm geeking out over, what? Well, let me think. Uh, I Oh, I recently, the last novel I read was called The Last Policeman by a guy called Ben Winters. Now, I'm a bit late to that party. It's been out a few years, but that was one of the best novels I've read in a long, long time. It's about uh, an asteroid has a massive asteroid. He's basically heading for the Earth, and it's going to land, and it's basically going to kill most of the people on the Earth, and there's nothing anybody can do about it. And this guy's a cop trying to solve murders. And it's you know it examines questions of why would you do that when we're all going to die in six months? What's the point to anything? Why do we do these things? It's a brilliant, brilliant book and a great mystery as well. Mm. Um, and then on TV, the last thing I watched that really blew me away actually was Stranger Things. So I'm really looking forward to the second series of Stranger Things that was announced at Comic Con. Yeah. Did you see any of the uh, sizzle reel from season two? No, no, I'm deliberately avoiding it. I don't, I don't, you know, it was good enough. The first season was good enough. I trust them. I don't need to see right. trailers and spoilers. I just yeah. want to go in cold because I went you, into the first need season the date. <laughs> completely cold. Yeah. 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 Well, that's kind of, that's kind of how I am as well. But yeah, I won't divulge anything to either of you then. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I, frankly, I also learned my lesson after Rogue One. Yeah. Uh, because I, I liked that movie. I liked it a lot more than most people, but I was so annoyed at some of the shots that were in the trailer that I was really looking forward to, and then they just are not in the movie, oh, and yeah. that really annoyed me. Mm-hmm. So now I'm on a kind of – now I've gone swung completely the other way, and I'm just avoiding trailers. <laughs> well, basically, at the rate that like Hollywood is reshooting like everything now, like Justice League is under heavy reshoots, uh, Han Solo, speaking of Star Wars, is under heavy reshoots. Yeah. So true, but that's that, things have always been re, you know oh, reshoots yeah. have always been a part of of making movies. So I don't know that you can necessarily put it specifically on that. I mean, there was one shot in that Rogue One trailer. In fact, no, there were two shots that they knew weren't going to be in the movie. That like Gareth Edwards has gone on record saying, "Oh yeah, we knew that was never going to be in the movie, but we it looked great, so we wanted to put it in the trailer." Mm-hmm. And I'm like, that's that's not fair, man. That's not playing fair. <laughs> that's just, yeah, that's rude. Yeah, one perfect shot doesn't do <laughs> doesn't do trailers. <laughs> um, well, Anthony, before we uh, before we let you go, is there any anything else you'd, you'd like to plug while we got you on? Um, unfortunately, everything else that I'm working on at the moment is stuff that I can't talk about. Mm. Uh, the most recent video game that I worked on, not that I wrote myself, but that I worked on, was called Blackwood Crossing. And that is, you know, this uh, genre of indie narrative-driven adventure games that's mm-hmm. had a resurgence in the last couple of years. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's a game along those lines. It's made by a Bright- Brighton-based uh, studio called Paper 7, and it's their first, you know, sort of original game. They've done lots of licensed games and stuff before. And I consulted. I was a narrative consultant on that game for them. So I helped guide the narrative and sort of looked at drafts of the script and gave notes and, and feedback and what have you. Um to uh, and their, to their head writer Ollie Reed Smith, who worked on the Room games, if you've played those on the iPad, um, and it's an absolutely great game. And I can say that because, like I say, I didn't actually write it; I was just a consultant. And it is an emotionally uh, driven in adventure game, storytelling adventure game that is just superb. 
uh, and by the end of it, you will be in floods of tears. It's uh, so I would encourage it, and it's only like I don't know, fifteen dollars or something on Steam. I would encourage everybody to go and check that out. I think it's on PS4 and Xbox as well. So uh, yeah, that was. I think more people should play that game because it's a great game and it hasn't quite had the recognition I thought that it deserved. It's called Blackwood Crossing. Blackwood Crossing. All mm-hmm. right. Slapping it on my wish list right now. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Excellent, excellent. Um, well, all right. and I guess in the meantime, then, yeah, the first issue of Ghost Station Zero available in comic book stores everywhere on Wednesday, August 2nd. Of course, the first codename Babushka Adventure, The Conclave of Death, is available in comic book stores everywhere or on Comixology if you're more digitally inclined. Pick up Dead Space. Pick up uh, A Shadow of Mordor. Uh, uh, if I remember correctly, you had done some. Well, the the wasteland just did that. The, did the wasteland just get a new deluxe edition? Oh yes, it did actually. Yes, yes, we've reissued. Uh, well, we've issued a, a compendium, the first of two compendium editions of Wasteland into those. You know, the big com- soft cover compendiums of like five hundred pages or something ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, basically the first half of the entire story you know, is now available in one massive compendium volume. It is an absolute beast of a book. Yeah, you could kill a man with it. <laughs> you could kill two men with it. <laughs> um, well, I, I mean, you're getting two two compendiums out of it, so that's four. That's yeah. that's four. There you go, four men. Yeah, <laughs> even more deadly. <laughs> yeah. And of course, you know, check out the coldest city and the uh, the coldest winter on, uh, available on Comicsology or through Oni Press, and, and watch Atomic Blonde. Uh, Anthony, Please do. Yes. Uh, thanks. Thanks again for coming on the show, and you know, as always, you're welcome back anytime. You're very welcome. Thanks again for having me. This has been another Geek Out production. If you enjoyed what you heard, hey, you know, we've got a special episode every Friday. Of course, there's the usual catching up show every Wednesday. And you get book club episodes just about every Tuesday these days. Thanks for listening.